Jeanette and Alexander Tachka died in each other's arms only hours apart after 75 years of marriage. The wife told her husband as he was dying, wait for me, I'll be there soon. This San Diego couple's last moments made international news in 2015, and why wouldn't they? It's the dream story, evidence of a true match made in heaven. We have a collective hunger for stories like this. Stories that seem to offer counter evidence to the refrain that at death we will part. How could a story like Jeanette and Alexander's really end when their lives ended? They didn't think it would, but were they misguided? Naive? No, they're actually seeing things totally clearly. Their lived experience and the response that it stirs in each of us is evidence of a greater reality. If the idea that God makes a bond like theirs grow so strong only to split people apart after death doesn't sit well with you, you're not alone. We intuit the eternity of marriage. But wait, what about the Bible? Doesn't Jesus say that there's no marriage in heaven? No. Jesus was talking about marriage in a symbolic way, which, by the way, is how Jesus always talks about everything. Here he's directly addressing the marriage of love and wisdom that we all need to begin forming in ourselves during this life. Love and wisdom together is what makes heaven. So if you've consciously and intentionally turned away from loving others and refused to surrender self-interest to the higher goals of love, you can't magically have that once you've crossed over. That's the point Jesus was making. It's a point made to help us in our spiritual lives, not made to ruin the hopes of millions of couples who are in love. God wouldn't do that because God can't do anything that is contrary to what God is, and God is the marriage of love and wisdom itself. So the love married partners share is not simply a chemical bonus. It's much more than that. It's the fullest expression of the dynamic living marriage of love and wisdom in all of everything created. Married couples in heaven experience a deepening of their love for each other forever, enjoying the highest experience of joy and delight and share an abundance of creativity in their life together. And in case you're wondering, yes, this includes sex because sex is an expression literally of a couple's love making. In heaven, couples don't have children together, but they do conceive and bear forms of love and wisdom, the result of their shared usefulness. But that doesn't mean you can't have kids in heaven. Reproduction only happens in the physical world, but couples in heaven who want to have kids are needed to adopt children who have died and so are growing up in heaven. Now, we don't have time here to dig into all the ins and outs of how the Bible has a spiritual meaning. For that, see our show, What the Bible Is, and for more on marriage in general, see our show's Spiritual Marriage and What Married Love Is. But for an in-depth treatment of how and why we intuit the eternity of marriage and what marriage in heaven is like, stick around. Spiritual marriage is eternal, and that makes total sense because that's the way that spiritual things are. Spiritual things just tend to be eternal, and physical things don't hold up too good. <laughs> I'm thinking about the paint on the outside of my house. I think about my body as I got more than to be more than 20 years old. That stuff just falls apart, right? It doesn't work anymore. But that's just because time eats away. Time and, and space eat away at physical stuff. Spiritual stuff is, is powered from within, and that may sound like I'm just throwing esoterics at you, but think about the moment of you're, you're, you're feeling this feeling like, I want to, hey, person, I love you. I want to spend my life with you. You're not saying, let's, yeah, I'm thinking about we'll have a good run and then it'll be over. In that moment, whenever you love anything, in that moment, it's just, it's eternal, meaning it, you're not thinking about an end. You're just thinking about the state itself. And that is because there is this instinct that we have that spiritual stuff, including this love that can bring people together romantically, that can lead to this lifelong bond. That's the, the source of that is not physical, it's spiritual. We also have this sort of indignance toward that, the idea that it has to end because it just doesn't seem fair. So you, you look at the couple that we referenced in the intro, how is God going to set up this thing where they, they love each other and they, they develop this life where they're together for 75 years and then, okay, you're apart and we're living this whole different thing and we'll, we'll, everything you guys built w was nothing. Why would you have these two totally disparate pieces of existence back to back that don't relate to each other? So we have this, from both sides, this instinct that 
it's got to go on. There's got to be something more to that. So this is from Swedenborg's book, Married Love, number 371. Within every love, so whatever, anything that you love is the potential for both fear and pain. <laughs> so if you've ever been through love of anything, you know that. Fear that the love may die in pain if it does. So not that, oh, this, this love is hurting me, but this, this is talking about you really love something. And you can, you could feel this. You can even have something, like I think about hanging out with my daughter, and it's okay, it's fun, and now she's, she's complaining about something, and I'm trying to, but as soon as you get any kind of fear of like, oh, what if something happened to me? You just realize how strong that love is. That's when you feel it for, for all the people you love. As soon as you realize, oh, something, something might separate us, then you feel like, wow, this is something. And then pain, if it does, if it is separated, you feel that pain. This holds true for marriage love. But it's kind of fear and pain we call zeal or jealousy, okay? The zeal of partners is justifiable and thoroughly within reason if they love each other tenderly because it's also a fear of losing eternal happiness, not only for oneself, but for one's partner as well. And also because it's actually a safeguard against adultery. So what's the nature of this marriage love? I mean, at its core, it's and between two people is, I care about somebody else. I, I care about how they're feeling. I care about m- maintaining a life that they enjoy like me. I care about doing things with them. So there, you're not only thinking, wow, I don't want to lose my happiness, but you're thinking, you don't want them to lose their happiness, which is this miniature version of how we need to think about the whole human race, right? Which is, yeah, we have ourselves, but how is everybody else doing? You got this permanent arrangement that puts you in that mindset. Also because it's actually a safeguard against adultery. So if you love that thing, you know that, hey, cheating on somebody, betraying that trust is going to destroy this. So that's where you get this mega resistance to that kind of breaking of the contract. Marriage love brings bliss to the... Here, here's what marriage love does for you. Marriage love brings bliss to the souls of partners, happiness, bliss to the souls, happiness to the minds, gladness to their chests, and pleasure to their bodies. Since these benefits continue to eternity, there can be anxiety about the eternal happiness of both partners. Yeah, you you don't want to unsubscribe to all of that stuff. And Swedenborg says you can get that kind of joy in a way you can't get it anywhere else from a truly loving marriage relationship. But is Jesus down with that? Didn't Jesus say something? Was it Matthew 22 verse 30 or something? In the resurrection, they are neither merry nor are given in marriage but are like the angels of God in heaven. And maybe he like just misspoke there. Well, it was recorded three different places, parallels to that one in Mark 12, 25 and Luke 20, 34 to 36. So what's he talking about? And what you're going to get here is the same bold claim that we make in a lot of our videos that Jesus was being serious, or it was serious when it said about Jesus that without a parable spake he not, that even there, talking about marriage in heaven, it's, it's correspondential, or it's a parable. It's telling us something deeper with the language, that actually what he's talking about there, because Jesus was concerned with spiritual things, are spiritual marriages. So, I'll explain what that means. This is married love 41. A spiritual wedding. Yeah, what is this to marry in heaven? A spiritual wedding is a connection with the Lord, and this connection can happen on earth. So it seems like we're complicating things. You're talking about spiritual marriage between two people who love each other and there's this bond in there, but also within yourself, there is this marriage that can happen with the Lord. Everything good happens in patterns. So you can have this marriage of you and the Lord and then the marriage of the two people, and then you are essentially marrying the human race in that you are looking out for its happiness and it's looking out for your happiness. There is this pattern, not just in everything, right? What, so, here we're talking about the connection with the Lord. When it does happen on earth, when it does happen on earth, when we are here in our life connecting with God, it's happening in heaven as well. Because the two are physical and spiritual are sitting right on top of each other right now. So, in heaven, the wedding is not happening, nor are they given in marriage all over again. Holding a wedding means becoming connected with the Lord, and going to a wedding means being accepted into heaven by the Lord. This one way you could look at this whole life that we're living is that God is popping the question to us. And the question is, like, do you want to marry goodness and truth? Do you want to? We have this life where we're looking out and there's, there's a whole 
uh, void filled with possibilities of things that you can enjoy and pursue. Right? So some things are constructive and they care about how other people feel and they make life better and other things are destructive and they exploit people. God is saying, like, do, do you want to marry the good stuff? Because the good stuff actually is the Lord. So this joining of love and wisdom inside of ourselves, marrying that inside of ourselves, that's what this whole life is about. That's why we need to have this life before the afterlife, is we are accepting that marriage proposal if we want to, right? Then the afterlife is like the relationship, because it's not just you get married and then you're done, right? There's the marriage is just a start. The, the living together is the actual substance. So the afterlife is it, but we don't have that marriage happen in the afterlife. We have it happen now. That's what, why bother to have something like this life, which is such a pain to go through <laughs> unless there's important stuff going on in it. So that is what Jesus Christ is talking about. And actually, that definition was a great relief to some people who had recently entered the afterlife that Swedenborg, in one of his out-of-body experiences, got to see and talk to because they thought it meant there was no relate, there were no relationships, romantic relationships in heaven, and they really wished that there was. So this actually, that definition uh, was a real like, oh, okay, I can breathe. Here's him describing it. On hearing this, the three newcomers said, it says in the word that in heaven they do not marry because they are angels. To this, the angelic spirits responded, Look up toward heaven, and you will have your answer. Why should we look up toward heaven, they asked. Because that is the source of all our interpretations of the word. Inwardly, the word is spiritual, and since angels are spiritual, they will tell us its spiritual meaning. After a brief wait, heaven opened above their heads and two angels came into view. They said, Weddings are allowed in the heavens just as they are on earth, but only for those engaged in a marriage of goodness and truth. And that means angels. And so the passage in question refers to spiritual marriage, which is a marriage of goodness and truth. And this kind of wedding is allowed on earth, but not after death, and therefore not in the heavens. Being given in marriage means gaining entrance to heaven where that marriage actually exists. The three newcomers were happy to hear this and were filled with a longing for heaven and with the hope of marriage there. We are going to work on our integrity and propriety of life, they said, so that our wishes may come true. So they're on the path. Like they're pumped up. They feel like this is worth putting that work in for. And what they've got to do and what we've all got to do is get this marriage of goodness and truth going on inside of us. You're going to hear about this all over Swedenborg stuff, but what is it and why is it so important? Why does the marriage of goodness and truth equal our spiritual rebirth? So why do goodness and truth need to be married in us for us to be spiritually reborn? Each of those things is very powerful. Don't they say all you need is love? Isn't that enough by itself? Or if you really have the truth, isn't that a powerful thing? Why do we need both of those things together? An analogy that Swedenborg uses repeatedly for this is the nature of heat and light in the way that things grow in this physical planet. If you have light as you have in the winter, but you don't have the warmth, nothing's growing. It doesn't matter how much light there is, you need both in order for germination to take place. If you have an abundance of heat, but you have no light. Let's say if it was absolutely pitch dark for a week or something, plants would look pretty sad and yellow. They're not thriving without the light. You really need both of those things. So in our minds, Swedenborg says we have two chambers, one that he calls the will and the other the intellect or the understanding. The nature of the intellect is that it can be lifted up almost into the light of heaven, he says, regardless of the condition of our will. So you can have these flights of your mind where you're lifted up into this state. But if what's in your will is still self-centeredness and corruption and evil, the, the mind will eventually come back down and settle to where the heart is because the heart is the real you. Both of those need to rise up together for us truly to be reborn. You need both. God is the marriage of love and wisdom. 
God's not just into the marriage of love and wisdom. God is the marriage of love and wisdom. How's that for a definition? That if God is unknowable, but one aspect you can know about God is that there is this permanent uniting of love and wisdom in God, that that is somehow at the heart of God. And it's that uniting in God that spurs God to want us to do that same kind of uniting in ourselves. This is how, this is why uniting that stuff in us unites us with God, who's also uniting that stuff in God. A lot of uniting going on. In Marriage Love 66, Swedenborg says, two married partners who enjoy true marriage love are effectively forms of the marriage of goodness and truth, or of love and wisdom. This is not just something that's, that's hanging out, like, oh, people, you know, fall in love with each other, so you guys go do this. This is us participating in the grand design that's in God is in everything that's made, right? And God is, another thing about God is that God is forever. As we were mentioning before, God lasts forever. God is eternal. So everything that comes out of God is eternal as well. Our life is eternal. This is, I mean, the the great revelation of near-death experiences and, and religions of all kinds is that the physical stuff, which does fall away, doesn't mean the end of the eternal stuff in you, which is your consciousness, right, your spirit. So another thing besides life flowing out from God, marriage, love flows out from God as well. It's, the, it's, it's why it lasts. It's why there's this feeling in it of wanting it to last. Here's a little bit of the technical side of how it flows into us. Every human being consists of three levels of being that follow a certain order within us. The soul, the mind, and the body. The inmost is our soul, the middle one is our mind, and the outermost is our body. Everything that flows into us from the Lord flows into our inmost level of being, the soul, comes down from there into the middle level of being, the mind, and comes through that into our outermost level of being, which is the body. That is how the marriage of goodness and truth flows into us from the Lord. It flows directly into the soul, goes on from one level to the next, and ultimately into the extremities. And if these three act conjointly, following this order, they bring about marriage love. By picturing how this flow works, it becomes obvious that a married couple has that form on the deepest levels, and then sequentially on the next levels. And so a marriage between people can actually be the form of this part of God. Don't let that go to your head, but this is from Marriage Love 65. True marriage love is nothing more or less, more nor less, than the joining together of love and wisdom. And two married partners who share this love between and within them. So they both marry love and wisdom inside themselves, and then from that as a foundation, marry love and wisdom between them, become an image or form of this connection. You are, you are doing God a solid because God is like the essence and you are providing a form. That, that's what the whole God-human relationship is doing. So God wants this to happen for us because the whole point of having this image form relationship is that that's the way God can bring us all the happiness that we can possibly experience. So God wants that condition for us. And so he's not just going to say, that would be great if that happened. He's going to provide the means for it to happen, too. This is from Marriage Love 229. To anyone, because, sorry, before I read this, because you can say, oh, it's, it'd be so, it's so great to have uh, a really great relationship with your soulmate. Of course, of course, people want that. Everybody wants that. It's hard to get. It's hard to keep. So, so is this just some elitist thing that a few lucky people in movies get? Marriage Love 229. To anyone who longs for true marriage love, anyone, not, not even who who is, is cool and has marketable skills and, and is attractive, to anyone who longs for true marriage love, the Lord provides compatibility, a compatible person. If it doesn't happen on earth, then he provides for it in the heavens. 
So you don't have to, if it's not happening here, Swedenborg, who's writing all this, didn't get married to anybody on earth. Then he provides for it in the heavens. So you will, the soulmate thing will happen here or there, but in the scope of eternity, it's worth getting it right. This is because all marriages based on true marriage love are arranged by the Lord. You know, the good side of arranging, a a matchmaker, you know, being there for you. It's not a, so it's not a responsibility that you have. I've got to find this. I've got to cultivate this. I've got to make sure that, that I get this right. This is, if if you're in, if if you say, I'm I'm opting in, God is going to hook that up because, because the marriage of love and wisdom is, is absolutely on the front of God's priority list because it's what goes on that brings us the best happiness, but it's just essential to creation. The marriage of love and wisdom is everywhere in everything. So us participating is, is us participating in something that is totally ubiquitous. Swedenborg writes that we can see evidence of God as the marriage of love and wisdom all around us. It's in the symmetry of our bodies, the right and left sides. You can see it whenever you have two of something, like night and day, rocks and water, or flowers and fruit. This unified duality, or the distinguishably one nature of love and wisdom, as Swedenborg describes it, is wonderfully reflected in the yin-yang theory in Eastern thought, or the eternal relationship between Shiva and Shakti in yoga philosophy. Both reflect the interdependent, yet seemingly opposite natures of love and wisdom that are at the foundation of everything we experience in life, like substance and form, stillness and action, or silence and sound. When you look for it, you find evidence of this relationship between love and wisdom, working together to create and sustain life in infinite ways everywhere. Now let's talk about the experience of marriage in heaven. Because we're going on and on about it. It's going to last for a long time, and God thinks this is a good idea, and it can reflect everything. But what's it actually like to be in it? What, what is the participation experience like? This is from Heaven and Hell 382. We're actually talking about the, the ceremony itself. The marriages in the heavens are not the same as marriages on earth. Nothing is exactly the same in the heavens and on the earth. In the heavens, there are spiritual weddings. It should not be called weddings, but unions of minds because of the union of the good and the true. So goodness and truth are in the mind, what we would maybe call the mind and the heart. It's that stuff connecting. It's, really, it's not really are you holding hands or not. It's, it are the minds coming together. On earth, though, there are weddings because they concern not only the spirit, but the flesh as well. Further, since there are no weddings in the heavens, and this is cool, this is interesting, two spouses there are not called husband and wife, but because of the angelic concept of the union of two minds into one, each spouse is identified by a word that means belonging to each other. Let me introduce my belonging to each other. So something about the the, the thing itself is all centered around we are coming together uh, on a mental and emotional level level, that there's some kind of productive union there. So, if it's happening, what's it feel like? What is God bringing? What what train of experiences is God bringing to these people who have this kind of relationship? Well, the first thing, we'll break it down into three things. The first thing is a deepening of their love forever. (laughs) It gets better forever. I don't know, that's not funny, but it just strikes me as intense, right? Because you can think of something lasting forever, Sure, if, as long as you don't try to think of forever in a, as a sequence of a bunch of days, but you just think, okay, always. But to get better forever, like, okay, this, this year we're, we're even more in love, even more in sync than we were, you know, last year and back and back and back, hundreds of year equivalents in the spiritual world. It's always getting better. This is Marriage Love uh, 177. For couples who are committed to true marriage love, it becomes deeper and deeper to eternity. They, okay, and here's where, here's where that depth is leading. They become a single individual as their marriage love grows stronger. And since in the heavens, this love is genuine because of its source in angels' heavenly and spiritual life, two married partners there are called two when they're referred to as husband and wife, but one when they're referred to as angels. So you've got this balance between autonomy and mutual interdependence, which is the thing that characterizes all of these relationships that come out of God. Like the person-God relationship. We grow closer and closer to God, but yet have 
this sense of independence more and more so as we get closer. They're the saying, okay, you, yes, you're recognizable as these two people, but you're really one person, but you're two, but you're really one. And that joining together, just like love and wisdom, why are we talking about love and wisdom? Why don't we just talk about mm, some word that means both of them? Because they are these two things, right? So those combine. And the second thing you get out of that, the, the, the joining together leads to something. It, it opens up the pathways for joy and delight forever. I mean, everything, everything that God is trying to do for, with people the, the point of it is the, the real lasting happiness of the people involved. So, so it is with this. Marriage Love 69, I realize that few people can accept that all kinds of joy and pleasure from first to last are combined in marriage love. Since this is so rare on earth, meaning whenever Swedenborg was writing this, mid to late 1700s in Northern Europe, there wasn't a lot of this marriage love going on. It could be that there are the seeds of it, in people, but the actual, like all of the the legal unions people had, you were not seeing this. It's actually something we don't know a ton about here. So it's something we can certainly draw um, parallels with and experience glimpses of, but really it's something, it's a rare bird and something that you you come into. I don't know if there's more of it now than there used to be. I I don't know. So he says, the only way to describe its incomparable happiness is from the mouths of angels because they're the ones who experience it. So this is something that's happening in heaven. Oh, and you want to know what they said about it? Well, here's what he described. The angels talked about three levels of pleasure on the soul, the mind, and the body level, and the deepest pleasures of the soul. Remember, this is all stuff that's going on in this spiritual marriage relationship. The deepest pleasures of the soul it's really, it's beyond comprehension. You can't describe them well to us. You can get some sense of it, though, uh, as peace and innocence, that the couple experiences what would we would call peace and innocence together. This is just coming into the edges of our perception. As things move down, they get a little more understandable. The, on the mind level, there is bliss, there is happiness and dwelling together. And then on the body level, there's pleasure, what he calls pleasures in the heart, full body pleasure, and what the newest translation calls the greatest of pleasures. And we know what that is. We're old enough to know what that is. He's talking about sex. Each of these, the angels said, uh, they're all working together and they're all eternal. And it is from this whole kaleidoscope that you get the fully satisfying joy that, that this marriage relationship puts people in. And now on to number three. Did you remember that we're in the middle of the list of the three positive conditions of married couples in heaven? Yeah, and the third one is shared creativity. So there's this correlation in heaven between married love and usefulness or constructive activity. Actually, every everything good that you feel in heaven, every happiness that you get is somehow tied to you've done something that helps someone somehow. So even marriage taps into that to make it enjoyable. This is Married Love 183. Talking about the nature of love. Love cannot rest until it does something. So love is not content just sitting by the pool because love is in fact the active principle of life. Nor can wisdom exist and last except when it is doing something out of and together with love. And that doing is some useful purpose. So they've got they've got to hang out. They've got to hang out and do something together or else not even love and wisdom these two archetypal essences of the universe. They're nothing without this partnership and this activity. The more people love to become wise for a good purpose, the more they enjoy full vigor and potency in marriage love. So going out and learning how to live well and doing it gets you more into your marriage rhythm. So it's not just like you, the more you get into the other person. It's about your participation in life. And the more they have this vigor and potency in the two of them, the greater their pleasure. Useful purpose is what makes this happen. Since it is within a useful purpose that love does what is good by means of wisdom. And when that happens, love and wisdom take pleasure in each other and play with each other like children, so to speak. So this is the love and wisdom There's some in your mind getting together, right? Your partner's got love and wisdom in their mind. And then together you have love and wisdom as well. So the love and wisdom is even alive and has this whole sort of life of its own. As they mature, the partners are drawn together by the activities 
of marriage. This is accomplished in part by engagement, wedding, marriage, and childbirth. Such things happen continually in great variety to eternity and are brought about mutually by love and wisdom deep within useful purpose. So just like the cycles that partners can go through, love and wisdom go through those little cycles as well. And it's all centered around this joy in being useful or doing something. And usefulness is joyful because usefulness, doing something, do you know what I'm talking about when I say useful? Doing something that helps is love and wisdom uniting because it's a desire to help and then it's knowing how and, wh- and knowing it's the right thing to do and then accomplishing that, actually making that difference. And when there's two people in a relationship that are working together to do good things for the world, that am- gets that amplifies that connection between the two of them. It, you, so there's a l- uniting of love and wisdom. I don't know why this just feels like, yeah, this is the one. And the, uniting of love and wisdom inside each partner, but then it also unites in the activities they uh, undertake together. And it's this, it's actually even for relationships in this world and sex and that being enjoyable, the root of it is this usefulness that couples have. So it's this correspondence to the things couples can be doing together, procreating, growing closer, s- serving the world in some way. All of these, you know, are, are the spiritual essence behind the joy that you can feel in sex and in marriage. And this continues in the spiritual world, because even though there you're not having physical offspring, like here people do, you do actually have what are called spiritual offspring. This is Marriage Love 44. Through their ultimate satisfaction, two married partners are more and more, by the way, ultimate satisfaction, another euphemism, two married partners are more and more closely united in a marriage of goodness and truth. The marriage of goodness and truth is a marriage of love and wisdom. And love and wisdom are the offspring born of such a marriage. So even the the love you have for each other creates the goodness and truth that is the, you know, life of the human race. I mean, it's God coming through all of us, but this is like a crucial role that couples can play for the common good, not just for each other, but for the common good. This is why in the intro, we use that pun about love making. There is this creation of love. This is Married Love 3, Marriage Love 355. Since the good that we love and the truth that we understand love each other endlessly. So the goodness and truth, you think about them as abstract things, but they, somehow they love each other. They want to be united endlessly. And when the deeper levels of the mind are open, the spiritual marriage love, that spiritual marriage love flows down freely with its own endless urge and sustains this ability. So there's, there's this eternity in everything. By the way, this is Swedenborg quoting an angel, what we're, what we're hearing right now. So sometimes Swedenborg will ask angels a question and then re- record their response at length. That's what we're in the middle of. They go on. The human soul itself, being this marriage of goodness and truth, not only has a perpetual urge to unite goodness with truth, so we, this is something we want, but also to bear fruit and reproduce its own likeness. When as a result of this marriage, the deepest levels of our mind is wi- deepest level of our mind is wide open straight from the soul and it continually seeks to have its effect on the outermost level of our being so that it can express itself then that perpetual urge in the soul to bear fruit and reproduce also arises in the body so the the outermost pleasures of marriage and sex are, are have their roots in this inner desire to join goodness and truth. Since the ultimate way the soul operates in the bodies of a married couple is in the ultimate physical expression of their love, and since this depends on the state of their souls, it's obvious where this endless ability comes from. Our fruitfulness is likewise endless because there radiates from the Lord a, pers- a pervasive aura that fills all of heaven and the entire world. What's God sending out into the heaven and the world? an aura of producing and spreading the heavenly effects of love and the spiritual effects of wisdom. Spread the love, spread the wisdom, and the natural effects that come from these, namely offspring. However, the kind of fruit we bear in the heavens is not the same as the fruit people bear on earth. The fruit we bear is spiritual, the fruit of love and wisdom or of goodness and truth. The goodness and truth 
is coming out of heaven. So we are playing our role here on earth, and the relationships we have here can do all kinds of useful things for each other, for society, and in heaven, there's that same, uh, there's, there's that same, there's that same pull towards usefulness, but the role it plays is different, but it's interconnected. Like, we are, we are better off for what they're doing, they're better off for what we're doing. It's this, you're both looking inward, you know, at, you're looking at someone you love, and it's this very intimate, there's two people that are hanging out, and having uh, a lifelong relationship, but also that relationship is meant to be looking out towards serving the greater good, and that's why it's such a cool thing. Uh, we started our business after we were married. So we do gardening. I have my degree in ornamental horticulture, and we uh, and we have a love of gardening together. But then we also make headstones. So. It's a weird combination, but it works, and uh, that's sort of how it started, and it all sort of happened. The headstone thing happened at the same time as uh, we were starting our business. The, uh, so it, we just invested into that, and we were, we've been doing headstones and running our own business for about, what, 12 years now? 11 years? Eight years. Eight years. We've been married for 12. Yes. 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 That's good. <laughs> Most of the stuff we do is we specialize in pruning of trees and shrubs, and we do garden installation and con consultations, and uh, and we're doing a lot of installations this year, which is which is cool. We also do uh, one of the fun projects that we do is when we get called in to sort of rehabilitate an area. Mm -hmm. So somebody buys a house that's been the yard's been neglected or overgrown, or they just have been busy with other things in their life. And they're like, okay, now we want to address this. And then we get to have the fun of sort of helping the, draw out what their vision is. He is great with the relationships and he's outgoing and he's interacting with people. And I'm about the accuracy of the estimates and do we bill them? Are we paying our guys? Do we have enough money to keep the business going? That kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. and, and scheduling. And so what's fun yeah. for me is not necessarily fun for him yeah. and vice versa. With just a little bit of shifting around and a little bit of pruning and a little bit of scale and color, you can make something that's sort of average and boring into something really beautiful. As, as our business grows and we have um, fewer times where we're actually working in the garden for a customer and we're together and all the other, the employees have gone home and it's just the two of us finishing up as the sun's, you know, getting lower in the sky. And we're not even necessarily talking, but we're both working on the same project and making mm -hmm. something that's already beautiful, even more beautiful. And I just love that sharing. We get to work together. That's the fun part. Mm -hmm. We, I, I do, like, I, I wouldn't want anybody else to work with, like, as a, like, every day. Um, it's like I get to work with her. She puts up with me and she's really smart and she has really good eye for a lot of things that I don't really have a good eye for and uh, we complement each other that way. But that's the gift of it is that I do. I look forward that we're sharing this experience. It's our business, it's our life, it's our marriage, it's our friendship, all of it. It's ours. It's, it's, it's hard work, don't get me wrong, but it's not as much work as it is fun. How'd that go? That go? I, th I think that's true. It's, okay. There's there's effort and there's ups and downs, but we wouldn't do it if we didn't enjoy it. So that's true. It's pretty fun, actually. Mm -hmm. So what did we learn today? Uh, we talked about the state of joy in spiritual marriage and how spiritual marriage is always looking to serve the wider world and community. We, we talked about how in the spirit, in the afterlife, you can have a spiritual offspring. You can be creating love and wisdom with your partner. I, I do want to mention here, in case you are feeling like, oh, love and wisdom, like uh, maybe you really want to have kids there or you never got to have kids but wanted them here. People have kids in heaven that even though there's not the reproduction, the very starting of souls in heaven, there are uh, children who pass away tragically, you know, in this world all the time. And there are, it, there's a need for angel parents to take care of those kids. Swedenborg talks about people having as many kids as their, their parental nature 
want. So there's very much still the need for child rearing. So people are doing that. There's also the love and wisdom thing. So it's really like, come on, it's heaven. Of course, there's going to be all the good things there. Also, everybody has the opportunity to be married in heaven, if that's what they want, to, to have this soulmate partnership. It's not the haves and have nots. If you, you don't have to, but if you want it, it's there. And this is also not something you just got to put off. You can be working on your eternal marriage right now through marrying the goodness and truth in yourself, because the eternal marriage is people who are, have married goodness and truth, marrying that goodness and truth together. You can be doing your part right now. You can already be doing couples work on that right now. We did a couple shows about, we did a million shows about how to marry goodness and truth. It's what, it's what we talk about. A couple that might be good to go check out now if you want to know more. We have one called the day-to-day process of, your, of our salvation, which is like a cool look at sort of the, the choices we make and how that connects goodness and truth or breaks it apart. We also did one called Regeneration, How Radical Love is Born. And again, comparing love and wisdom to the, the processes uh, of birth that, that correspond to it. So that's our show. I hope that you got a sense of excitement and anticipation. Hope you felt like those people in the afterlife Swedenborg was describing who's like, yeah, I want that. Let me, let me get myself in order so that I can go and pursue that. And I hope it's something you can take with you into your relationships, into how you live your life and, and you know, come out of it with something good that looks towards, you know, doing good things for the whole human race. Thanks for watching. Now you can journey with us all week. Every Monday's Swedenborg and Life episode, including this one, has a week's worth of content lined up to support you in your exploration of these life-changing ideas. All video content premieres at noon Pacific Time, 3 p.m. Eastern Time, and 7 p.m. Greenwich Mean Time. On Tuesdays, find us on social media or go to offtheleftei.com to get custom downloadable art paired with the week's topic to ground you through the week. On Wednesdays, join us to dig a little deeper into the week's topic with news from heaven. On Thursdays, we want to hear from you. We'll be sharing a new reflection question weekly on our community tab and social media channels. Then join us for Swedenborg Live on Fridays for our panel Q&A show. And listen every Sunday to the Inside Off the Left Eye podcast to always know what we're up to and what you can look forward to. If you want to help sustain Off the Left Eye's operations, consider becoming a monthly donor today. And right now, we have a matching gift challenge from a very generous donor couple where dollar for dollar up to $10,000 will be matched when you make a new or increased monthly donation. You can provide a direct gift or restrict it to our new Off the Left Eye Endowment Fund. Giving to the Endowment Fund is a great way to guarantee that your gifts live on to help Off the Left Eye forever. Go to otle.cosvox.com to become a part of our essential community of donors. From all of us here at Off the Left Eye, we thank you.